So uh, we're in our second uh, message on stop inviting people to church. And as Michael shared last week, the whole idea of this is that when we talk about answering the call of Jesus Christ to make disciples, somewhere along the way we think, this is step one, I invite you to church. Like, I meet you and I invite you to church. Now, let me be clear. That's not bad. It's all, it's, it's, it's just not the first step. Okay? So let me put it to you this way. If, if you uh, have a favorite restaurant, what's your favorite restaurant, Roger? Texas Roadhouse. Texas Roadhouse, okay. So Roger's favorite restaurant is Texas Roadhouse, all right? And for the first time, all right, you're meeting Cindy over here. Cindy's never heard of Texas Roadhouse. In fact, she's a little nervous about restaurants, period, okay? She's just, she's not sure if she likes to go out. She's not sure about public, okay? And you came over and you met Cindy for the first time. Should your conversation should be, hi, my name's Roger. Would you like to go to the Texas Roadhouse with me? No. See how bizarre that is? Okay. And Cindy would be like, uh, I don't know you. Is that like a place where they kidnap people? <laughs> Texas Roadhouse, is that somewhere that's on the road? Is it When you say it's a restaurant, is it like a hot dog stand or driving by and it's a roadhouse? Or it sounds like a pretty rough bar. Is this Patrick Swayze going to be there or not? That's why I need to know these things, okay? And so, so, but that's how we do it with church. And we meet Cindy. Hi, Cindy. You know, Jesus loves you. And, and would you like to go to church with me? And Cindy's like, whoa. Now, even if Cindy knows what church is, and by the way, if Cindy knows what church is and she's not there, that probably means she's got some broken experiences. And so you've just invited her to what? Come and be broken all over again and relive all those terrible nightmares that you once had. You see the problem? And so one of the things that we want to encourage you to do is actually stop inviting people to church until you've built a relationship with them and you've already started leading them to Jesus. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. Wait a second. That's your job. That's what we pay you for. <laughs> Not really. You pay me and come because you want to learn how to do that better and want to learn how to be equipped. It'd be the same thing as the army going to the general. Well, wait a second, that's what we pay you for. You're the general, you go fight. We're gonna, we are just show up every week and get trained. No, you, you're here to be trained to go make disciples. Now, some of the training means we care for each other, right? Some of the training means we lift each other up, we hold each other accountable, right? And so, so, but here's what you need to know. The church is the only organization in the world that exists for those who are not members. It's the only organization in the entire world that exists for those who don't, who, who don't already belong. The whole purpose of the church is to go make disciples. And why is that the case? Because that's what Jesus said. <clears throat> Ready? And anytime someone can predict, no, no, I'm doing this on my own here. This isn't how it works. Ready? Anytime someone can predict their own death and resurrection and pull it off, we should do whatever they say. So when Jesus, as one of his final things he says to disciples is, go make disciples, we go, got it. Yes, sir. We'll go do our job. We'll go do our job. Okay, so let's talk about this. First of all, just let me give you a couple ideas. Before we share Jesus, we need to be with Jesus. If Roger didn't love the Texas Roadhouse and go there himself, it would be silly for Roger to be out promoting the Texas Roadhouse, right? <laughs> Texas Roadhouse has great food. What's your favorite thing that you eat there? I, I don't actually ever eat there. <laughs> Come again? Well, I mean, it's way over there. It's I mean, it's busy and it's crowded and, and their prices are a little high and Ooh, but you still want me to go there. I want you to go there. I want you to experience the Texas Roadhouse. But you have you ever been there yourself? I've never been there myself. You see how weird that is? Okay. Uh, and here's what, what we got to do is we first have to make sure that we have a relationship with Jesus. Now, the good news is nobody says, hey, you have to graduate to the fifth level of relationship. You have to be at this place with Jesus. You just you got to make sure you're with Jesus first, right? You got to walk. The walk before you off the talk, right? Right. 
So step one, before we get there, is make sure that you have a healthy, intimate, passionate, growing relationship with Jesus. Now that's, that's huge. And again, you and I know many people who have told someone they love Jesus, even talked to someone about Jesus, and then and the very next thing they said, you went, I don't think that's how someone behaves who loves Jesus. I talked to someone last night. Came into our house, we were hanging out with them for a little bit, and they were saying that exact same thing. He says this guy was at a tattoo parlor, and the guy goes, I'm a preacher, and he was telling him, all this, the next thing he knows, he's dropping all these F-bombs and saying all this stuff, and he goes, there's something wrong with, uh, there's like, inconsistency here. And he goes, immediately I stopped listening to it, and then he had to say one of our youth on the trip, for the first time, said, the reason I, this is, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, she said, the reason I struggle with Jesus and with church is because my mom says she loves Jesus, but my mom also says she hates all her kids. So again, her view of a Christian is what? Someone who loves Jesus but hates everybody else. There's a reason we have trouble helping her see how good Jesus is, and this mission trip was amazing for Brendan Manning wrote a book, uh, Ragamuffin Gospel. Great book, by the way. It's a, little, it's a little dated now in the sense of it's an older book. But I love the phrase he used. The single greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, but then deny him with their lifestyle. Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, but deny him with their lifestyle. Again, you and I have experienced that. You and I have seen that. You and I, at points in time, have been broken by that ourselves, right? And sometimes the last place you receive grace is at the place it should be founded on. Right? And so that's one of the challenges we have as Faith United is as we continue to grow to be a place of amazing grace. Why? Because that's who Jesus is and we should look like Jesus. All right, so step one is make sure you've been with Jesus before you invite someone to be with Jesus. Make sure you've been with Jesus before you invite someone to be with Jesus. All right, now, let me pause and just say, all right, I get that this is a little scary. I get that you probably, if you've been in the church more than a year, you've heard, I should go make disciples. I should talk to someone about Jesus. I should, I should help them get to know about how do I do that? And in the 80s, we were all taught this. You walk up to someone and you say, hey, if you died today, do you know where you would go? And I don't know if that actually ever worked well or not. I mean, people came to Jesus in spite of us, Right? But it really isn't a good tactic to use. And so one of the things that we've been trying to teach you over the last uh, couple of years since Faith United has been ex in existence is just ask better questions. You don't have to have all the answers. In fact, if you have less answers but more questions, you're probably going to be really good at this. And we've said, like, hey, what does a cross on your necklace mean? Hey, I see you're a great dad. You're doing a great job as a father there. Uh, tell me, do you, do you have a relationship with, with God the Father? What does that look like? Hey, you got a tattoo there. It says something in another language. What's it mean? Oh, it's, it's a karma tattoo. Great. What does that mean to you? Do you, do you think karma's true or not? By the way, if, if karma's true, we're all going to hell, right? Because that's what we deserve. So praise God, karma isn't real, right? In fact, there are moments in just confession that I wish karma was real, right? There's a couple people that karma should have hit, and they haven't, so I know it's not real, right? So, again, all I'm doing is just giving you a couple quick examples of how to engage someone and just ask the right question. Now, the, anywhere in that, did you see me actually lead someone to Jesus? Because the, the goal is to move people closer to Jesus. I don't have to take them all the way to the altar yet. That, that may happen. In fact, that's like a great opportunity to invite someone to church. Or, again, you've done that and then invite them to church. It's even better. Like, hey, you love Jesus. You're a committed disciple. What's the next thing I do? You need to go to church. We need to get baptized. We need to be rolling. Right? In fact, the six kids that gave their life to Jesus. It's like, what's next? I'm like, well, we're going to set up a baptism Sunday. That's what's next. We're going to get a hold of the Y. We're going to go to the pool. We're going to dump them. All right? Just like donuts. Wow. <laughs> so I, I, let me just say, this can be intimidating. It doesn't need to be. 
as Michael said last week, it's about I have developed a relationship with someone. And now that I have a relationship with them, now I've won the opportunity to speak into their lives and begin to move them towards Jesus. Amen? All right, if you got your Bible with you or uh, your Bible app, we're going to Matthew 28, the story of the Great Commission. Matthew 28, the story of the Great Commission. It starts out in verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Why are there eleven disciples? Judas is dead. Hey Jude, what did you do? Right. Now, here's what's interesting. All right, Jesus takes the disciples right back to the very place where he started the ministry. Remember where he called the first ones and along the Sea of Galilee? Now, when it says he took them to the, uh, Galilee to the mountains, all right, one of the things that we don't understand, we think of Galilee as a lake, and it is. All right? But Galilee actually is a whole area of mountains. Okay, Much like you and I might say, well, we went to Appalachia. You went to the whole mountain range? Well, that's what kind of, okay, what do you mean by that? So Matthew doesn't give us a whole lot of like, Oh, hey, we can go find the spot and build a church or do something silly on that spot. We just know there are somewhere in the mountains. And, and what you want to know is that there's an upper Galilee and a lower Galilee mountain. And I, I've done a really good job of circling those. I wanted to take a moment be proud of myself. Right. I have no idea what color I used. All right. And then you have the Sea of Galilee over here. Now, again, the, the importance of that is that we often see God giving commands on a mountain, right? What other commands do we get on a mountain? The Ten Commandments. Very good. Give that lady a star, right? We also see God bringing comfort and new commands on a mountain, right? Elijah just came out of a sticky situation on Mount Carmel. Right? Oh my gosh, it's a slow sound. I'm the one jet lagged on the mission trip. Sticky situation, Mount Carmel, folks. Come on, stay with me, all right? And then he goes all the way to Mount uh, Sinai, and there God speaks to him, not in the fire, not in the wind, not in the earth shaking, but in a still, calm voice, and says to him, what are you doing? If I'm with you, what are you worried about? Right? And we see Jesus give the Beatitudes, where it's the setting of Matthew, on the mountainside. And so over and over again in Scripture, you see kind of God giving new revelation on the mountain. And so it's no mistake that Matthew's setting for this is once again on the mountain. And now Jesus is going to say for the disciples on the mountain, all right, you got to go make disciples. But when they saw him, they worshipped him. And I love this. Don't miss this. But some doubted. Now this is Jesus who, by the way, was dead, what, just a little while ago, right? Like 30 days ago. He was dead. Now he's been back alive. Now he's been hanging out with us. And what I want you to see is that nowhere in Scripture do you ever chastise or told you're stupid or been criticized for doubt. In fact, in the very story of the Great Commission, it says that some are still doubting. Why? Because dead people stay dead, right? Nobody's expecting dead people to go, come back, right? That's why you don't ever go up to the cemetery and just see people lined up in lawn chairs waiting for the next body to come out, right? That's just weird, right? Because we all know dead people stay dead. So even though Jesus had been with them, even though he was still around, some of the people who were there were still like, I just can't believe this. The point of that is, it's okay. Hey, faith is not the opposite of doubt. Certainty is the opposite of doubt. Faith is saying, I've got all this evidence. I'm making the next logical, rational, and emotional decision. Okay? Faith is the opposite of certainty, right? Certainty is a mathematical situation. And math is really the only place where we find certainties in all of life, right? Two plus two is four. We're all certain of that, right? There's no way around that. Nobody has to have faith that 2 plus 2 is 4. It just is, right? It's a known fact. It's always going to be. It won't change. We're not going to have a new discovery next week, right? But you and I have faith moments. The things aren't certain, and they're logical. Nobody came in today, checked their chair, shook it, and was like, I think this will hold my weight. And nobody sat down really slow just in case it didn't, right? You just have faith. Why? Because you've got experience, right? The chair looks steady, so there's logic and rationale behind that, right? And you've seen other people sitting down and you said, well, if it holds that person, I'm probably good. And so you just sat down, right? But it was still an act of faith. 
faith. And now here's what I want you to understand. Every worldview is based on faith. And almost everything we do is based on faith. You have faith that the person in the hamburger place who just made your sandwich isn't doing weird things with their hamburger. It takes faith. You have faith that when you mess up at home, your spouse is still going to love you. They don't have to do that. You just have faith that that's the way it's going to work out. Now that's built on all kinds of history, experiences, and vows that you made and promises you made. But what I want you to understand is all our experiences, every worldview, every religious worldview is based on some aspect of faith. Faith is not the opposite of doubt. Certainty is the opposite of doubt. And most of the world, except in math, doesn't work on certainty. It works on faith. They worship him. Let's pause here a second. I love the fact that they worship him because that's evidence that, that Jesus believed himself to be God. Over and over again, you will hear the argument, Jesus doesn't claim to be God in Scripture. And I just want to say to that person, are you reading the same set of books? And I say books because the Bible's a compilation of many books, right? But are you reading the same set of books that I am? Because over and over and over again, there are moments where Jesus may not say, I'm God! Stop. But over and over again, Jesus says, I am God! In different ways. And this is one of those moments, right? We see in Deuteronomy, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6.13, Worship the Lord your God and serve only Him. That was during the temptation with the desert and wilderness. But we see here at the end of this, they worshiped him, but some doubted. By accepting worship, Jesus is what? Hey, I'm God. Right? By accepting the worship and praise of others. We see the disciples then come along, and they don't do that, do they? Peter's like, whoa, whoa, don't be worshiping me. Right? Even the angel Gabriel says, whoa, 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 I'm, I'm just an angel. I'm just a messenger. Right? We see Paul say, whoa, 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 I may have done amazing things, but don't, don't worship me. There's only one deserving of worship. We see Jesus on the other hand saying, worship me, that's fine. Why? Because he's saying, I am God. Now that's huge. We have to understand who Jesus is if we're going to go tell people about Jesus. Jesus claimed over and over and over and over and over again to be God. Yes, he didn't come right out and say it very often. Why? Well, because that would have got him killed earlier before his time had come. And so the, the logical argument for why Jesus doesn't come out in the first chapter and say, I'm Jesus, I'm God, everybody got it, moving on, is because they would have put him to death right immediately. Because they believed anyone who claimed to be God was blaspheming, deserving of death. And so we don't see Jesus overtly making that claim in Scripture. We see Jesus making all these parabolic claims and these all these hey I think he just claimed to be God and we know people get it because they get mad at him and they try to kill him earlier right? what you need to understand is that by accepting worship Jesus actually claimed to be God now I just heard a lady on YouTube just this past week say you can't trust Christians they have this false idea that Jesus is God and she goes, and you know what? I read all the entire Gospels, and nowhere in there does Jesus say, I'm God. <laughs> now, the problem is she had a bunch of views. And I could go respond to her, but like five of you would watch, and only five of you would like it, which I'm not against any of that. I'm just saying that she had a huge influence. And now all these people who are watching her are like, yeah, Jesus never claimed to be God. And so we need intelligent people who are out there making disciples going, oh, wait, wait, that's how not to read the Bible. You're not going to understand what's going on and why Jesus didn't overtly claim to be God over and over and over again. Now, what I want to do is I want to take a moment with this doubt thing. And again, I, 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 just, I feel like there are moments where even those of us in the church doubt and we're afraid to say it. In fact, right now, if, uh, the Barnum Research Group did this poll with college students and said, hey, what's the number one frustration you have with church? And they said, there's no place for questions or doubts. How did they get that idea? Well, maybe we gave them silly answers like, well, just it's in the Bible, just trust it. Which isn't really a great answer, right? Or, well, Grandma said it was true. I won't say a lot of things are true. I mean, not all of them were true. Let's just be honest, right? <laughs> but we also didn't share any moments where we doubted. 
And so we never taught the kids it was okay to doubt. Why? Because everybody who came up here and spoke had absolutely no doubt, and had absolutely no struggles, and they got their life perfect because we all put on our perfect outfit when we came into church, and we put on that fake smile. There we go. Yeah, and, and again, we, we put the makeup on so we didn't look tired, and we're, we just came in, we're good to go. <laughs> How's your life? Fine. Right? This is where I said, we got to be authentic. we got to be a place where it's like, I have doubts, I have struggles, I wrestle, I need grace. That's what people need to hear. But that's okay because I'm not worshiping me. We're not worshiping the building. We're not worshiping this group. We're worshiping Jesus, right? And you notice I gave you the five uh, questions that every world you must answer. Now, these are a big deal. You need to memorize these, okay? I'm just giving these to you. You need to memorize these because these will help you out in every conversation you ever have. It's origin, identity, meaning, morality, and destiny. Origin, identity, meaning, morality, and destiny. And why this is a big deal is because any conversation, you can take them back to these and you've got them hooked in Jesus. You can't have answers to any of these unless you have Jesus. Okay, you can't have an answer for where did we come from unless you have a God. One of the kids was asking me, I need help. I don't understand. How did, how did God make all this? Like, I don't understand. And I said, well, God's outside of matter. You know what matter is? God's outside of matter. So something outside of matter made all this. Your confusion is that why and how God made all this, you think God's part of it. God's outside of it. Right? And so I said, you, you don't have Legos making other Legos. They don't build other Legos. Take someone outside a Lego world to build the other Legos. And she goes, well, but what I don't understand is you say God lived forever. How is that possible? I said, well, that, once again, something that is in Legoland that had a beginning and end when you started building can't be the builder, can't be the designer. It has to be someone outside of time who started Legoland and is able to see past the beginning and the end of Legoland that you just built. She said, no. Now all we're doing is talking about what? The first question. What's the origin? How do you get, how do you get all this to begin? Origin Identity, meaning, morality, and destiny. We need to know those five questions. We need to ask questions of other people about those. Okay? So when someone says, as the gentleman who rode through the fire, look, I just, I think, I don't believe in Jesus, but I think we should all be good because karma and good things happen to good people. And I so, and I could, it just wasn't the moment, but I so wanted to say, can I have five minutes with you? And so I sat down with the kids at breakfast and I said, what should we ask the next question be? What should the next question be? And one of them raised their hand. <laughs> They've been hanging out with me way too long. They said, well, how do you know what good is? Excellent. Excellent. It's the perfect end question. How do you define good? Because if you don't have God, there's no definition of good. It's whatever you feel like. And then the, what I feel like is different from what you feel like because you're hungry and I just ate and we got a problem with good, right? Ultimately, apart from God, you can't condemn the Holocaust, the wars, or any brutality in the world. Only when you have a theistic God who is outside of morality, who has defined morality and it never changes, can you get to what's good and bad. The second question, by the way, is, well, why do good at all? I said to the kids, is it more beneficial to you personally to do good or to do evil? To be selfish or to do good? And they all went, to be good. And I went, really? And they all went, to be selfish. <laughs> <laughs> and knew what the answer should be. But then I walked them through and I said, you know, if, if in your world there is no good or bad, there's no God, why not just take whatever you want? And again, all we've done is ask questions. But they're all based off of these five worldview forming pieces. You want to go make disciples? If you know these five pieces, you can ask any question relating back to this. Okay? I talk to kids all the time. I'm really struggling. I, in fact, I'm having suicidal thoughts. Oh. Well, my self-worth is really down. Oh. Well, good. I don't really care about your self-worth. You didn't make yourself, did you? No. 
then somebody else who made you really has determined your worth, right? Because if you made yourself, you get to determine your value. But if somebody else made you, then they get to determine your value. I'm more concerned about your God worth, not your self worth. You see how that works? All right. Let's move on here. Uh, faith covers the gaps of knowledge. It turns out that the atheists have a bigger gap of knowledge because they have far less evidence for their belief than Christians have for theirs. In other words, the empirical, forensic, and philosophical evidence strongly supports the conclusions consistent with Christianity and inconsistent with atheism. That's from uh, Norman Geiser and Frank Turek's uh, great book, uh, Why I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And by the way, if, if you don't have this book, you haven't read it, uh, it's a must read. It's not an easy read. I want to be very clear. Not an easy read at all, but definitely a must read. All right. Most people, though, are resistant to Jesus not because you have good logical arguments, but because they have some kind of emotional crisis. I don't believe in Jesus. Why? Well, I don't understand anything about God. God can't be real. Jesus can't be real. All right. Let's walk through that. And about two questions in, I always say there's three layers of questions. After two of them, I usually can get to them to the heart of the question, and that is, well, if God was good, he wouldn't let Grandma die. Now, let me tell you why the apologetics and where we've been is so important. It's because you got to go through the head to get to the heart. you got to go through the head to get to the heart. Okay? Nobody starts out saying, God, my Grandma die, therefore I don't believe in it. Right? Because nobody wants you into their heart to relive that pain. They're just going to say, well, God can't be real. Oh, let's talk about that. But once you get through their head, the goal is to get to the heart. This is why we spend so much time helping you do apologetics. Why? Because the mission of the church is to go make disciples, move people closer to Jesus. And so uh, arguments that people have against Jesus normally stem from an emotional place. If God was real, he wouldn't let that drunk driver hit that girl. If God was real, we wouldn't have starving people in this place. If God was real, that, those people wouldn't be shooting those people. And the irony is they're making moralistic arguments against God that they can't back up logically but they feel so strongly about it that I appreciate their argument. Again, I've said over and over again the number one argument against God isn't a logical one because there are no logical arguments against God that are great. They're all emotional. And I appreciate that. Because let's face it, we've all been in a moment where like, God, if you really love me, that wouldn't have happened. It hurts so bad. Right? If you were really in charge, that wouldn't have happened, right? We've all been there. And we had to hear that lie, and then we had to beat it back by saying, but the truth is you do love me. And bad things still happen. And the Christian worldview, the biblical worldview, is the only worldview that has an explanation for that. Sin entered in and corrupted everything God made. Let's move on. Matthew 28, 18 says, Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Exosia, uh, the right power has been given. And now Jesus says, Now I give it to you. Go make disciples. I give the authority to you. And that authority is given to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Steve. You get a free stroll on Wednesdays today. All right, through the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within you, right? And now you are empowered to go. So when you go, you're not on your own. Jesus is like, good luck, see ya. Jesus is like, I will be with you. I will give you the words to say. I will give you wisdom. I am going to give you power and authority. Now, go. Now, go. When uh, I started out coaching basketball. Wesley was often our team helper. He loved going and being a team helper. And I sat the guys down after he got old enough, and I said, all right, now look, this is Wesley, my son, team helper. If Wesley comes to you because I'm out in the hall talking to some teacher or something and says to you, do this, I want you to understand, he has my authority. If he says do this, you guys better be doing that when I come in. And I said, and if he says something silly, you can come to me after you've done it and say to me, hey, did you really want us to stand on our heads for 20 minutes? <laughs> no. And now I'm going to have a conversation with Wesley. But what I want you to understand is he has my authority because I trust him. He's not going to say anything silly. And if I say to him, hey, go tell the boys to start doing this, I want you to start doing that because he has my authority. Jesus said, all authority has been given to you. We don't understand. We have the authority over the demons of this world. We have authority over heartbreak. We have authority over the darkness. We have the authority of Jesus Christ with us. We are not alone. We are superpowered. That's the Holy Spirit power. Hallelujah. 
It should be a theme song. Matthew 28, 19. Go, therefore. What? Therefore? Well, because you've been given all authority. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always. I said to the kids, I said, those of you that have become disciples today, I want you to know there's only one promise Jesus gave you. He will be with you. Make disciples. Uh, this is from the, the verb matatuyo. Uh, it means uh, go make a pupil, go as one who learns from another, who studies from another, uh, someone who's bound to their master. This is a big deal because, again, we've got to be disciples before we go make disciples. We've got to be with Jesus. We've got to model what it means. And ultimately, it means you're in charge, Jesus. I'm not. And again, that's against the very first temptation in the garden, right? Adam and Eve choose to become like gods. They say, I don't want you to be in charge. We want to be in charge. Discipleship is actually the return to the way things were meant to be when God created. You're in charge. We're followers. We're not in charge. The primary way of Jesus' command there, then, is in the act of going. Here's the challenge with the church. We kind of hope people just show up on Sunday, don't we? Like we're just hoping the church grows as it should because people saw our cool website and thought we should they should show up. And that happens. We kind of think the church should grow. Why? Because people will just one day be walking down the street and go, I think I need Jesus. Go, Lord, where should I go to church? Faith. Faith what? Faith, faith ignited. I heard it. Thank you, Jesus. That's not real, is it? How are people going to get to know Jesus? It's when we go. That's why Jesus said, go make disciples. That's why Jesus sent the disciples. Discipleship is an act of going to people, not waiting for them to come to you. Now, the good news is some of you already have people that you've gone to. And made friends with, and you're all set to make disciples. You just didn't even think of it that way. And by the way, if you don't have someone in your circle that doesn't know Jesus, you need to make new circles. Why? Because you don't get a vote. Right? Because what? Anytime someone can predict their own death and resurrection and pull it off, we should do whatever they say. And so if you're not making disciples, you're disobeying Jesus. There are a lot of people I don't mind disobeying. But the guy who holds my future, I really want to obey. I really want to obey that guy. What is a disciple? It's someone who has a healthy, intimate, passionate, growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Not someone who's perfect. Not someone who's got it together. It's someone who, what, is moving closer to Jesus at all times. So what are we going to go make? Hey, I want to tell you about having a relationship with God. Not going to a building, not going to church. That's why we say stop inviting people to church. I want to tell you about having a relationship with God. And that's the big difference. And if I can pound one thing into your head today, that would be it. You're not inviting people to church. You're inviting people to have a relationship with God. And if they're against that, just encourage them to stop. and Get to know Jesus apart from whatever previous experience they've had. And then baptizing them. Now we could spend a whole sermon on this, but Jesus is basically saying... Hey, we baptize them so that they go and obey. So that their life is changed. We're not inviting them to Texas Roadhouse. We're not inviting them to a building. We're inviting them to a life change moment where they leave going, I don't know how I would have done this without Jesus. This is the most important thing in my life. It's a relationship with the eternal, holy, loving God. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for leading me. Doug was a great example of a mission trip. You heard him say, I have to lead Lily to Jesus. You know who was more excited about that? Doug or Lily? Doug. Because let me tell you what, there is nothing greater than leading someone to Jesus. There is a Holy Spirit work there, and you like, I could float right now. That's why Jesus invited us to do it, because he's like, I want you to have this experience of leading someone to Jesus. And knowing the beauty of saying, Welcome back to the family. 
So I encourage you today, as we continue this series, to begin to go, who is it that I know that doesn't know Jesus? And instead of inviting them to church, why don't you invite them to get to know Jesus? Go, therefore, and make disciples. We pray with you. Holy Father, we give ourselves to you, and we give thanks that you have empowered us to go make disciples. Now lead us to recognize those in our sphere of influence who don't know you. Lead us that we may lead others to you. In the name of God, the Father Almighty, we pray for this opportunity. We pray your will be done. We pray that we have the right words to say, the right ears to hear, and the right heart that loves people enough to say, I want them to be in heaven with me forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Blessings, guys. I'll see you next week on Father's Day. Have yeah. a great week. Again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.